I'll just give you kind of a, you know, what, what we're doing. We're going to do one more Acts today. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 17. Then next week, we're going to do the Lord's Supper. Uh, we are, uh, you know, we've, we've got the packets. There's no way we can healthy wise do that, you know, with passing and the crackers and you picking the crackers up and all that. Uh, so we felt like it was important to have the Lord's Supper, folks. We haven't had it in months. And uh, we want to do that next Sunday and observe the Lord's Supper. And then uh, we'll go into our Christmas, uh, you know, sermons and the Christmas season. Uh, so today I want to talk to you about the unknown God. The unknown God. Uh, if you have a outline there with you, we do have uh, programs that you can get as you come in. Uh, number one, the unknown God, Paul's strong witness. Paul's strong witness. The second thing I want you to see today is Paul speaking on Mars Hill. Paul speaking on Mars Hill. It was an incredible uh, sermon. Uh, you talk about against all odds. He, I know he had to feel like he was the only one there. You know, that new Christ, and you will see this in Scripture. And number three, the one true God. There are many gods, little G's out there, folks. But there's only one true God. And that is the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible. And we'll emphasize that here in just a few minutes. You know, when we left two weeks ago, Paul left Berea because of the Jewish leaders uh, they had come from Thessalonica and stirred up a crowd and got them. And uh, he, of course, Paul had to leave that town uh, under the cover of darkness. And he uh, left again, got on a ship uh, where we start in verse 16, Acts uh, 17, 16. And uh, he arrived at the great city of Athens, not as a sightseer, but as a soul winner. Europe was Paul's mission field now, and there were literally thousands of people who needed to hear the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Athens was the center of cultural and education during uh, culture and education during this time period. There was a famous university uh, there, as well as many beautiful buildings with a great commerce center. The city was full of idols. There was paganism everywhere. There were many philosophers there. It is said in that time there were over 3,000 statues in the city uh, of Athens. And there were over 30,000 gods that people worshipped. They had gods for everything, folks. Everything. And, in, and the Greek culture promoted humanism and worshipped the powers of nature. Greek myths spoke of gods and goddesses to the point that you had many gods to choose from. Paul's heart must have been broken for the lostness of the people of Athens. He truly had a huge task at hand, but wasn't afraid of it and was ready to tackle it head on. Let's look at this new ministry Paul was about to start in this pagan city. Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Paul's strong witness. Now while Paul waited for them, and then was Silas and Timothy, if you remember from a couple of weeks ago at Athens, his spirit was provoked uh, within him when he saw that city was given over to idols. Paul had ministered in many countries and he had covered many miles. Uh, we are still on his second missionary journey, but he had never seen anything like Athens. Idols were everywhere. Everywhere you turned, you could see idols. Uh, they worshiped gods uh, everywhere. I remember when I was in India, we went to a, uh, and we went down by a marketplace, but there was outside that marketplace, there was a temple there, and it was a monkey temple. And you, they literally had a statue bigger than I am of monkeys. And when we looked at that, they, they had put food all around that, that idol, that, that statue there. There was chips, there were crackers, there were all kinds of things. And for some reason, they were thinking uh, this God, the, the monkey God, I guess is what they would call it, 
would come and if they fed them, they would, uh, you know, uh, see goodness and, and, and bless them. It was, it was just standing there. I, just, I was just puzzled, I think. What makes them think you should put food out for a statue? It, it made no sense to me. But I thought of that when I was reading uh, this first verse. Verse 17, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogues uh, with the Jews and with Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. He always, when he came into a city, went to the synagogues. And obviously there was a synagogues there. It was not out of his routine. Uh, that was the first place he went. Because there is no indication that there was a church there. None whatsoever. And I'll be speaking of that later on. And the thing that happened in Athens, the marketplace was the place where lots of congregate, congregating went on. Okay, conversations went on. It's kind of like a tea house or a coffee house now where they come in and, you know, open mics and, and things like that. But this was of a, of a huge stature. It was big. It was large, large, large. And Paul saw that also. Then certain Epicurean and Stalic uh, uh, philosophers encountered him and some said, what does this babbler want to say. Now, Epicureans, you have to understand, were materialists. And materialists say basically they did not believe in creation. They believed that matter always existed. Okay, earth as we know it was always there. Uh, they believed that all of life was a thing of pleasure. Okay, uh, much of their pleasure was, uh, you know, uh, was, was just, let me let me just put it this way, immoral, okay? It was not good in what they called pleasure. They did not believe in any afterlife whatsoever. Most of them believed when you were dead, you were dead. And many of them were atheists, okay? They did not believe in God, okay? Not in God. And then the uh, Stoic philosophers, they believed in self-mastery. Uh, Okay, uh, they thought if you just discipline yourself, if you just take care of yourself, everything's going to be all right. They uh, really talked against feelings. They were they they just said, you know, there's no reason, you know, to get, you know, cry. There's no reason to have feelings towards something uh, because everything really doesn't matter. Uh, they they, you know, taught that you were indifferent to pleasure or pain. Uh, their belief system was panthe pantheist, which means there were many gods. Okay, they served many gods. And, and again, different cultures, uh, even on the uh, Native American uh, reservations uh, where we were up there for five years, uh, everything that you could see, they worshipped. They worshipped the sun. Uh, they worshipped the moon. They worshipped birds. They worshipped trees. They worshipped all kinds of things. So we, we can look around and we can... Uh, look at some of these things that understand what Athens is. And the reason I say it, even as Athens, it is on a huge scale. We are talking, uh, you know, uh, these, these coffee shops, these marketplaces were massive. And there was hundreds of people uh, in these places. And after Paul spoke for a while, they asked the question, verse uh, 18, what does this babbler want to say? Which meant one of two things, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't a compliment, okay? Babbler simply means that he's just talking. Uh, what he is saying is making no sense. Uh, of course, you know, as far as the Bible as their supreme authority, uh, you know, that's, that's not a part of the pagan world, folks. It's not a the part of, of that culture and that lifestyle. All right, they, they would think of many more things and other things uh, than that, uh, which had nothing to do with Christ and God. Uh, others said, uh, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. They actually thought he had gods that they didn't know anything about. Because they were unfamiliar with Scripture and they were unfamiliar with Jesus Christ. So they even thought his uh, descriptions of his gods was something uh, that was totally 
uh, different, totally new. And it made them very curious. It really did. Hold your finger there and go to 2 Corinthians 4 with me. 2 Corinthians 4. Paul is speaking here. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. I can imagine how Paul felt in Athens. Okay, he, he, he could not connect or relate to most of those people there. There is lostness and there is darkness, and it was a combination of both. You know, uh, you know, the presence of God and the Spirit of God, I'm not saying it wasn't there because it was, but it was nothing like, some, nothing like uh, things that he had ever preached. It's nothing like speaking to someone in a church. It was so different. All right, verse 2, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And basically, folks, there are a lot of people that do not believe the Bible is God's holy word. They don't. And the first thing they do when you start witnessing them or talking to them, that says, well, I just don't believe the Bible. And I believe this is exactly what happened to Paul. And he is mentioning this in Corinthians of what he, is, what, what he was talking about. Verse 3, but even our gospel is veiled. If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, which means veiled is hidden. Okay, there not everybody grew up in church. Not everybody grew up in the Bible Belt. Not everybody has Christian parents. And there are people in this world, all right, for whatever reason, they do not have a concept of God, our God, big G, not little G, big G, our God, Jehovah God of this Bible and the written word of God. And folks, uh, they're lost. Okay, they're lost, they're perishing. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who is Satan, all right? Who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. But folks, there's good news there too. I'm telling you, nobody is so lost they cannot be saved. Nobody is so far gone or do not understand or cannot comprehend, okay? There's this thing now we use called relational evangelism. You just don't walk in the first time and just hammer them with the gospel, all right? You know, you because and, and, a lot of times people just, one is they don't understand it. Two, they need time to process it, okay? So uh, there's nobody that is so... Uh, away from God that they cannot be saved, verse 4 says. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. All Paul was doing was trying to preach Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And folks, everything that we are centers around the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it says, verse 6, for it is the God, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And folks, these people that are lost are walking in darkness. They don't understand God loves them. They don't understand uh, God created them. They don't understand that, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for them. And you talk about resurrection, especially in Athens. It was so far from their minds, these uh, philosophical thinkers, these deep thinkers. And folks, I'm not putting them down. I'm simply saying, you know, they, they couldn't see the forest for the trees. They didn't. But, but, but Paul is later on saying, hey, I got good news for you. Our job is just to tell them about Jesus. And it's God's job uh, to take that uh, and to present salvation to them. So we see in the marketplace, because he couldn't. He couldn't go to uh, you know, a, a New Testament church because there wasn't one. But he went where the people were. He was waiting, if you remember, 
on Silas and Timothy. And while he was waiting, he couldn't just keep his hands tied. He had to be busy doing our Lord's work. So we see Paul's strong witness. The second thing I want you to see, and by the way, I want to say truth is the Word of God. Jesus Himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Relativism, you hear this term nowadays, basically says there is no ultimate standard for truth. Some people even say truth doesn't exist. Others say truth is what you make of truth. And folks, I got news for you folks. Truth is the Word of God. It is the Word of God, and it's, it's what we have staked our lives on. It is our instruction booklet. It is God's inspired Word. And so the second thing we need to see here in Scripture is Paul speaking on Mars Hill. Mars Hill. Look at verse 19. And they took him and brought him to uh, Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is for which you speak. Areopagus uh, was a council. All right, there were 12 members there, and they were the ones that would judge this person's speech. Okay, now I know Paul's preaching, but they see it as a speech. And Mars Hill was named after uh, the god of war. It was a place, a big amphitheater. And on the front, there was like a stage. And that's where the person who was speaking, uh, they gave them time to speak. And, and these 12 men decided if this was truth or if this was not truth. Verse 20, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. And they weren't Paul wasn't in a court of law. That was not a court of law, all right? It was a council that was set out because uh, so many people came from different countries and, and different uh, backgrounds and, you know, different things, all kinds of nations. And, and it was a place where you could uh, find every person under the sun. And, and people would come there and they would give their speech. And they would give their thought. And even in the marketplace, a lot of all it was around was, what is the new news? What, what do you have to say? What, what do you know that we don't know? And they used this word, enlighten us. Please enlighten us on what you say. Well, folks, I can enlighten whoever I need to enlighten through the word of God. It really doesn't matter what I think. All right, it doesn't matter how well educated uh, I am. And I believe in education. I really do. I just thought this was a great illustration. Uh, Thurman, you were there and Steve were there. We were at a pastor's conference about 10 days ago. And it was the last one where we got together. And there was a door prize to be given. And uh, Jeff Thompson, basic, you know, he always picks dates out. And he said... If you had an anniversary or if your birthday is on Thanksgiving, then you'll win this book. Well, you know what the book was? The book was the book of theology. The book of theology. And let me give you a definition for theology in the simplest form. I could break it down, but the simplest form of theology is a study of God. Folks, we need to know what God thinks. And what the thing that got me is when after we got through, you know, our Thanksgiving message and I picked this message up on Monday, I started looking at the book and you know what the first, the first chapter was on? It was on the theology of God. Now folks, think about that. Think about this book being given at that time. And Lori's birthday, my wife's birthday is on Thanksgiving. So guess who won the book? Why? Because I lobbied for Two is one, all right? It's her birthday, but we are one. And I, and I did. Monday night, I started reading through this book, and the whole first chapter applied to the sermon that I am preaching today. Folks, that's no accident. That is divine providence. That is God putting in place exactly what He wanted me to say 
today. And I, was, I truly was blown away by that illustration. Verse 21, and for all the Athenians, uh, the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or to hear some new things. And this, uh, you know, council was the one where they got him together and said, tell us, you know, these new things. We want to learn from you. Then verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of Areopagus and said, uh, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. And again, maybe not in the religious terms that we say are, that we say we are Okay, religious to me is, is, you know, the true church. You know, God's church. Religion is the word of God. The doctrines of God. But he was simply uh, giving them credit. He's all around you, you see these gods, is what Paul was saying. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. And why would they have that? Because there were so many gods, somebody thought, maybe we missed one. And so we need, we need a, a, a statue. We need, we need an altar to an unknown God. Well, my first question when I read this is, how do you worship an unknown God? If you don't know who it is or what it does, how can you worship that? But again, it's God's way of saying, I am God and you don't even know who I am. Folks, there's people are out there in our world today. There are people that don't even acknowledge God. They don't go to church on Sunday. They don't read their Bible. They don't, I mean, it is the furthest thing from their mind. And I understand living in the Bible Belt, it is not as common. But I'm telling you, all over America, there are people that serve an unknown God. And when I say serve, they don't, even, they don't even know what they serve. All right? And that's what he's saying. And it says, therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. You know what Paul was saying? Let me tell you about this unknown God. Hold your finger there and go to Romans with me. Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, verse 18, Romans 1, 18. Whoop, I'm in Corinthians. No wonder that didn't look right. <laughs> All right, Romans 1, verse 16. Excuse me, Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This is Paul writing. Paul's writing. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Folks, we have to believe by faith. Our belief system is based on faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from the heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Folks, people that are lost, they don't really care about the truth. They just are self-consumed. It's just about them. All right, They don't want to hear the truth. Verse 19, because uh, what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. Folks, I am telling you, if you would think about it, God is everywhere. Psalms 19 says, even the heavens declare the glory of God. All around you, you can see God. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that were made, even His eternal power in Godhead. Think about the solar system. Think about the earth rotating. Think about how far we are from the sun. Think about if we were one degree closer, all right, it we would burn up. If we were a degree further away, we would freeze. Who keeps all that going? Who placed all that? How can they say, I truly don't understand someone that says, I do not believe in God. You know what I 
really surmise in all of that? Do you know why atheists do not believe in God? Because they do not want to think they are going to stand before God and give an account of their life to God. So if they just don't believe in God, in their minds they're thinking, that doesn't apply to me. Oh folks, the scripture says they are wrong. They are wrong. Look what it says. Even his eternal power, the Godhead, so they are without excuse. I'm just telling you Psalms 8 speaks of the glory of God also. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And again, it's a really simple thing of grammar. Big G is God, Jehovah God of this Bible. Little G is all the other little gods or gods. Now look at verse 22, professing them to be wise. And folks, I am telling you, the Greeks, uh, you know, they, wisdom was a huge thing in their life. They thought being smart, being intelligent, and folks, I'm all for education. I'm all for that. But it doesn't make you saved. It doesn't save you. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, the birds, the four-footed animals, and the creeping things. And folks, if you think of Greek mythology, a lot of those things are around animals. They are pictures of animals, and they worship these things. And, and, and God simply says, that is not who or what you need to be worshiping. Verse 24, therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And that goes back to that, that worship of pleasure and sensuality, all right? Who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Folks, Satan has fooled them. He has fooled them. He, he, they, they do not understand God's systems, God's ways, God's holy word, God's holy spirit, all right? And worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So Paul stood up and started simply preaching Jesus Christ. Paul was speaking at Mars Hill, and I'm telling you, there weren't, you know, people of his, uh, you know, background, a preacher, an evangelist, a missionary ever asked to speak at Mars Hill. And I'm telling you, Paul told the truth to everyone that was under the sound of his voice. Now, look on in verse 24. We see Paul's strong witness. We see Paul speaking on Mars Hill. And number three, we see the one true God. Verse 24, God, capital G, who made the world and everything in it, since He is Lord of the heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. If you ever run across an atheist, I am telling you the thing that you need to do all right, you need to take them back to Genesis 1-1 and creation. See, Satan even has sold a bill of goods and a lie to us, and it's called evolution. And evolution has been disproved uh, by Bible scholars, folks. By Bible scholars. And even at this, what it is about creation is everyone knows to exist, something had to create it. And I believe with all my heart what Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And folks, that's the place you have to start. That's the place you have to start. And again, you, there are times that, you know, in conversations, most of the time, you're not going to get it in one session, in one conversation. You have to give them bits and pieces. But we have to say, because most people will say, you know, that does make sense, all right? Even though some of the philosophers believe that, you know, man always existed and earth always existed, it, it, it is not that way. And we start with creation. Verse 25, he is worshiped with, with men's hands as though, he, nor is he worshiped, 
uh, let me go back. Let me go back. Uh, he created everything, heaven and earth, and does not dwell in temples made with hands. And I'm sure Paul was looking around and seeing all these temples, ornate, huge, you know, their, quote, places of worship. But God was nowhere to be found in those idols and things. He worshiped, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Folks, God doesn't need any help in worship. We are to worship him. We are to worship him since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So what is the first thing he talks about? He talks about creation. Creation. And then it says in verse 26, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So what is he talking about? He's talking about he created all of man. All right? You know your birthday if you're sitting here today, but God knows your day of death as we are sitting here today. He knew he was going to create America to the place where it is. And the other nations, he set all that out, folks. He is creator. He is a ruler of everything. He has given life. He sustains life. Verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Folks, he is as close as the mention of his name. Folks, God is here. God is in this place. We believe in the Trinity, the Godhead. God the Father who created everything. God the Son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life. He died on a cross for you and I. He shed His blood for you and I. And on the third day, He arose. And we believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who comes into our lives at the point of salvation. Folks, we need God, we need Jesus, and we need the Holy Spirit in our lives all the time. Verse 28, For in Him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. And he quotes a couple of po poets there that he uh, had heard about. And he was quoting them because they are really in line with the Old Testament. Okay? Because if he just busted out the Old Testament, again, they would just say, ah, we don't believe that. We don't believe that is, is, is divine or it's canonized or it's the real deal. So he was actually smart enough to, to use their own folks to get, uh, you know, the message of what he wanted to do across from them. Uh, we, are, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devise, uh, devising. So what is he saying? The God that you see everywhere, that's your God's. But the God I'm talking about, he's not on a shelf. He is not an idol. He is not made of wood. Okay? We're talking about the infant God, the invisible God of this universe. Verse 30, truly these times of ignorance, uh, uh, God is overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So he gets to what he was wanting to say. He was basically saying, and I really think Paul in his heart of hearts knew this is going to be a one-time shot. So he didn't just stop and say, think about these things. He's saying, now that I have told you, you are responsible for the gospel. I've told you who created you. I told you what Jesus has done for you. You need to repent and turn to Jesus Christ. Verse 31, because he has appointed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And again, he is giving the gospel. He is talking about Jesus being the judge. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And he is going back to Jesus Christ and the cross of Jesus Christ. Now notice the reaction. 
to a sermon in verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Okay? Some literally laughed at him. Some probably said, Paul, you're crazy. You are out of your mind. Nobody rises from the dead. So they rejected the truth of the gospel. And others said, we will hear you again on this matter. They didn't reject them. They just wanted to hear more about it. They were trying to take it all in, but it was hard for them. It was just almost too much uh, for them. Verse 33, so Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. There are those that have truly believed that Paul in that was just frustrated and all that because if you remember at Thessalonica and Berea, you know, many, many people were saved. And folks, we should not put numbers on people. I understand you count people and I'm not against counting people. But salvation is God's business. Salvation is that. And just like preaching, the Bible says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst also. Same thing with prayer. God is there. If it's just you, there's three, three. with God is a person. He is the person. And there are actually four, just like four in the fire. In your own prayer time, God is there. So some believed among them the. Uh, Dionysus and Arapa, I can't say these words, uh, a woman named Demarius and with others. One of them was one of the 12 leaders of that council that was judging and listening to Paul. So you can imagine, you know, that victory alone, folks, would be victory in Jesus. Turn to John 5, John 5, and I close with this scripture. This is Jesus speaking. John 5, most assuredly, verse 24, John 5, 24, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who has sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. From death to life. And he is talking about those who were lost and get saved. All right. And it says, verse 25, most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and and those who hear will live for as the father has life in himself, so has granted the son to have life in himself. And he is speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right. If you believe that Jesus lived a perfect life, was born of a virgin, uh, you can have eternal life. Verse 27 has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave will hear its voice and come forth to those who have done good to the resurrection of life and to those who have done evil to the resurrection of of condemnation. And folks, I'm telling you, uh, for Christians, all right, it's it's that it's that day, it's that graduation day. It's that day uh, when we meet our Heavenly Father and we live. And the thing I am looking forward to is folks, that glorified body. Aren't you looking forward to that? I had a man tell me this morning, sat standing right out there. He said, Man, I listened to a guy the other day, and you know what he said? He said, when we get to heaven, you can eat all you want and you won't gain a pound. Man, I don't, (laughs) you know, again, theology-wise, I'm going to have to do a little research on that. I understand the marriage supper of the Lamb. But if that is true, you are going to see one happy preacher in heaven. And then verse 30, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is righteous because I do not uh, seek my own will, but the will of the Father uh, who has sent me. And the other judgment is for the lost folks. And that is the great white throne judgment. Jesus here was in the Gospel of John just telling the truth, saying this. And folks, here's the bottom line. Everyone is going to stand before God. 
nobody's exempt. You, me, everyone that has been born on the face of this earth will stand before God. And the truth of the gospel is there are only two choices. Okay, there are people that believe when you're dead, you're dead. But that's not what the Bible teaches. You are either going to heaven or you're going to hell. That's the truth of the gospel. That's what Jesus was saying. That's why Jesus died for you. So you wouldn't have to go to hell. And again, folks, there are some beliefs that almost, I mean, in some ways, you know, say, you know, and I don't want to get into the sovereignty and all that. It's for another time. But he went through there. His election was, you're saved, you're saved, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. You're saved, you're saved, you're saved. Folks, where is whosoever will in that? It's in John 3.16. It's in Romans chapter 10. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it tells me as we close two things. Number one, do you know God? I'm not talking about an intellectual sin. I'm not asking you if you go to church. Obviously, you go to church. Do you know Him as your personal Lord and Savior? And if you do, the second thing I want to talk to you about is there are people that are dying around us every day and they will go into an eternity lost. Lost. And folks, that's why we have the greatest news. The gospel literally means good news. We've got good news for those who don't know Christ. And I pray even during this pandemic, even during this holiday season, we will look for divine appointments and we will tell people about Jesus. I realize we're not on Mars Hill and we are not the Apostle Paul, but we are Christians. Christ is in us. He enables us to share the gospel with others around us. Father, thank you for the day. God, thank you for your word. And God, I just, uh, I, I, all week long I was thinking about Paul and Mars Hill. And Lord, most of the people there rejected his message. But God, I pray we not take it personally. God, our job is just to tell the good news. To teach the truth of God's word. And then God, you take it. You do with it what you choose. God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, today would be their day of salvation. God, I thank you that we have faith. I thank you that we have the Word of God. God, I thank you that we have proof of who you are, what you're about for our purpose in life and what we need to be doing. God, we're not out there aimlessly looking for something. When we get saved, when we put our faith in Christ, we found something, and that was Jesus Christ of this Bible. And God, I pray that we would live it, we would teach it, we would preach it until our last breath. God, we love you, we thank you, and Lord, if there's one here that needs to rededicate their life or uh, come and join the church, Lord, if, if they want to be a part of this fellowship, God, we welcome them uh, with open arms. So God, this is your time. This is your place. This is your church. God, we just turn the invitation over to you. God, you do with it what you choose. And God, we'll be careful to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?